ICQ Podcast Episode 360, GD77 Firma Review. Well, hello, fellow Amateur Radio enthusiasts, and welcome to this the 360th episode of the ICQ Amateur Radio Podcast. Supported this episode by Sandip Nembar, Douglas Rosser, VK2, Delta Charlie Romeo, and the monthly and subscription donors. This episode, Martin M1MRB is joined by Chris, Mike Zero, Tango Charlie Hotel, Martin, Mike Zero, Sierra Golf Lima, Leslie, Golf Zero, Charlie India Bravo, Frank, Kilo 4, Foxtrot Mike Hotel, and Bill, Whiskey Charlie 3 Bravo, to discuss the latest Amatan Radio News. Myself, Colin, M6BLY, rounds up the news in brief, and this episode we feature the new Open GD77 firmware review by Ed DD5 Lima Papa. Well, as always, this important part of the show is to thank the very kind listeners that uh, see the value in what we do and help us out with a uh, donation, uh, I say, to keep us uh, running advert free and paying our costs here on the uh, the inset. So, first, we'd like to thank uh, Douglas Rosser, VK2 Delta Charlie Rowan, for his very kind one-off donation, and also like to thank Sandip Nambia. Uh, for his subscription donation and he goes along with the other monthly name subscription donors in helping us provide a base to pay our way. As always, we'd like you to consider when you listen to the show what value you get from it. And uh, I say, if you get uh, something from the show that might be worth a price of a cup of coffee, a theatre ticket, or a, a trip to the cinema, uh, turn it into a monetary value. Visit icqpodcast.com forward slash donate and I say send that monetary value our way, I say, to uh, help us keep doing what we're doing. We're talking about getting, providing value. We're going to join uh, Martin, Chris, Martin, Leslie, Frank and Bill to discuss and generate thoughts about uh, the latest Amatan radio news, including Yota needs help and satellite light pollution. As always, hope you enjoy. This is an ICQ podcast announcement. For those listeners who've been with us for a while, you've heard us talk about hubs and not clubs. You've also, a number of you have said to us, we have far too much fun recording these episodes, and you think we are a radio club. Well, it's about time the ICQ podcast did something about that. So we would like to set up the ICQ podcast hub. Now, the ICQ podcast hub is going to be run on our digital network, and we intend to use the digital network because it's available to all of us, even if you don't have a digital radio, you can still listen or join in via a mobile phone. Now, what do we mean by we're going to have a uh, digital hub? Well, a number of you talk to us quite regularly on, on the, the talk group. Well, let's get together and discuss radio topics and what you've been up to. Because as amateurs, We're just as interested in what you've been up to as you're interested in what we've been up to. There's a lot of information that can be shared and we thoroughly enjoy doing it amongst ourselves and our listeners that do contact us on the ICQ podcast uh, talk group. So therefore, on the 16th of October 2021 at 1900 UTC, I propose to be on air on the talk group and meet up with as many of our listeners as possible, and we'll be joined by a number of the ICQ podcast presenters. I would suggest we'll be on for about a couple of hours, having a good natter, and uh, I've done more than that with uh, some people, honest. And in just enjoying ourselves, finding out what people are doing, and allowing you to uh, feel some of the fun we have. Now, I know that the time I've picked is particularly awkward for certain people due to the uh, time zone you're in. And going forward, I suggest that we will change our times to accommodate uh, other people in different time zones. Now, if you'd like to take part in this, please uh, email us any questions you'd like to ask us. Maybe you'd like us to expand on a feature we've done. Maybe you've got a a, a query or something that's been bugging you for years. Also, if you've been doing something that you want to tell our listeners about, then why not uh, just email us, let us know, 
and uh, we'll make sure that uh, you get your say on the day. Now, how to get involved, obviously, for those of you who don't have digital radios, or even if you do, check out the ICQ podcast website, where you'll be able to find all the information in the DMR section. So don't forget the uh, podcast website, www.icqpodcast.com. And if you're going to email us with questions or tell us that you'd like to uh, tell us what you're doing, just drop us a quick email on info at icqpodcast.com and uh, we will obviously accommodate you. We look forward to chatting to all of you and I'm sure it'll be uh, quite a fun and interesting uh, first meeting. So uh, that's where we are. So all that's left for me to do now is wish you a best 73s and enjoy the rest of the podcast. Well, hi guys, welcome to this episode's ICQ podcast, News Roundtable, and the News Roundtable for episode 360. What a number, eh? Tonight I'm joined by Mr. Chris Howard, M0TCH. Hi, Chris. Good evening, Martin. How are you for this wonderful episode 360? Glad to be here. Yeah, it was good to have you, Chris, and uh, good, uh, that's a little clue for, for the you listeners. What's about to happen? Good evening, Mr. Rothwell, who's often trying to get me into trouble, M0SGL. You know, sorry, I'm really sorry. I've got something floating in my tea. Hang on, hang on a second. How, how, how do we, how, seriously, how on earth did we get, got away with 360 episodes and no one's found us out yet? They have. They, they're not found out that we're just rogues. We're just making it up as we go along. How? I don't know. But good evening. Good evening. Also, uh, moving the other side of the pond, we have Mr. Frank Howell, K4FMH. Hi, Frank. Good evening, Martin. What a delightful occasion for me to join you here. This up oh, one moment. I've got a sip of tea here. Mm. Okay. I'm, can you hear me, Martin? I can hear you, Frank. <laughs> and... Also, on the other side of the pond, we have Mr. Bill Barnes, uh, WC3B. Good evening, everybody. It's episode 360. We've come full circle. It certainly does. And last but not least, we got himself, Mr. Leslie oh. Butterfield. Oh, Jeez. me. Hello, yeah. Martin. Good, e- good evening. Um, I, see, I see everybody's taking the enthusiasm pill this evening. <laughs> No, no, no. You've been very sedate this episode. <laughs> this was a term of endearment. They were impersonating you, Leslie. Oh, thank you yeah, so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mr. Leslie Butterfield, G0CIB. Good evening, Martin. But great to be on again. <laughs> yeah, it's great to have you. And the guys have been waiting so long for this, and you didn't do it, mate. Oh, never mind. Okay. Let's start the first news story. Jota and Jyoti are also looking for helpers. Now, Jota is the event that happens every year with the Scouts. It's uh, Jamboree on the air. It's happening between the 15th and 17th of October. It's a worldwide event. Uh, I think something that we really ought to uh, you know, promote uh, as amateurs and be around to help people. Chris, what's your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, you know, Martin, a few of us at the club have been involved in the past with helping out the uh, local scout group. We've got a bit of time. It's, it's still September. We've got a few weeks yet to uh, to talk to your local scout group, see if they want any help, see if you can uh, help them put a station on the air or other activities, maybe do a bit of, you know, Morse code with the kids or there's all kinds of things to do with amateur radio that you, that you, that you can incorporate into an event if, if your local scout group wants any help, you know, maybe an electronics kit or something, that sort of thing. So I think that's that's uh, that's a good one. It's a great way of getting kids involved in our hobby. And likewise, you know, if you're operating that weekend, listen out. You might hear some special events there. You might see some youngsters on the air. So please uh, please work them and give them, give them a good experience of, uh, of our hobby. Yeah, certainly agree with you, Chris. It's uh, an event worth taking part in. Bill, what's your thoughts on this one? Yeah, it's that time of the year again. Uh, October 15th to the 17th is the annual Scout event, Jamboree on the air, Jamboree on the internet. You guys are right. It's all it's all around the world. You'll hear some stations on. If you hear them on, uh, work them. 
help them out, give them some contacts. Likewise, I'm aware of the the North American um, scouting organization, the K2BSA. They have at least four or five, maybe actually more now. I just looked it up, uh, special event stations on. So it will be a K2BSA stroke, whatever call area they're in, such as stroke three, stroke six, stroke eight, stroke KL7 I see here on the list. But they're basically going to be on the air from various activity areas as well. So if you want to work some special events in you know relation to Joda, it's uh, the weekends, the 15th, the 17th of October. Yeah, certainly is. And uh, that'll be a good, I think that'll be a very good weekend. Leslie, what's your thoughts on this one? Well, I must agree with the sentiments already expressed. Help them out. Work them. Um, if you can offer assistance to the local scout group, please do so, um, and I'm sure they would be very much appreciated. I mean, this broadcast as we speak, I mean, Gilwell Park is just about a mile down the road from me, so you can imagine we, we're going to be having all the scouts on the local bus, bus and all the rest of it. Um, but uh, yes, help them out, and I'm absolutely certain they will be appreciated, and I hope the event is a success. Frank, your thoughts on this one? Well, I think Joda is one of the uh, programs that has been a clear winner. It's It really ought to be studied as a model for national societies to look at to see if we want to organize other events and activities. They ought to take a real hard look at Joda and, and how that's, that's working. Hard to find anything terribly wrong at all with this, and I'm just delighted to see it continuing. It's an exciting thing to share with hams, just like it is on how to build a fire out in the forest. Yeah, it certainly is, and uh, at least they can uh, actually do this. I mean, a lot of Boy Scouts now, certainly in the UK, are not allowed to carry knives anymore. I mean, Boy Scouts always had sheath knives when I was growing up, but there you go. Times have changed, Martin. <laughs> but they certainly are. You say I'm an old devil, that's fine, Leslie. <laughs> I can't. I've never said that. <laughs> yeah. Bye. what's your thoughts? I'll second that thought years old. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw something in the works here. Is this a good idea, considering the current global situation, getting everybody together in one space? I don't know. I'm still erring on the side of caution on you know, big group gatherings and stuff like that. I don't personally think they're a particularly good idea. Either way, it's obviously going to go, happen. They're, go ahead and it's happening. Listen in. Be available for some contacts. We did this a few years ago. We were calling on two meters, and all we got was one local idiot that kept replying, just telling his, telling us he was far too busy to assist. But he kept replying to us. If you hear them, even if you're doing a contest, please don't give them a five nine next. Talk to them. Your contest can wait. Give them a good impression. You know, talk to them about the weather. Anything. Just you know, give them a couple of minutes of your time. The the kids on the other end will really appreciate it. Here, here. Yeah, you're dead right, Martin, as well. They they have smiles from ear to ear when somebody comes back to them. And I know they're all used to using mobile phones, but it is slightly different, and they do kind of like it. So, uh, yeah, it's one we should all support. Right, moving to our next news story. There's talk here about satellite light pollution. Now, it does worry me because there's more and more satellites going up. Um, there's lots of ways we can play this this new story, and uh, but uh, I'll throw my little two pellet in at the end. Frank, what's your thoughts on this one? Well, b- back in a, a, a distant galaxy, <laughs> to, to use that, I was a young boy with a cheap dime store telescope, and I could see a few things in the air. And later. As a professor at Mississippi State, I won a graduate teaching award, and it actually had a check with it. So I bought a professional telescope, a Mead Schmidt Cassegrain, for those listeners who know what that is, a design of a telescope, and I bought a few um, eyepieces and that sort of thing, and, and watched the sky, and it's just a wonderful thing. Up north of me, about 60 miles, there is a wonderful private academy called French Camp Academy. It's basically an orphanage, but they do have schools there 
for day students. And they have one of the best observatories in the Southeast, including universities. It's incredible. And they are an official dark zone. And that's my lead in to uh, this particular story. We don't think about putting up satellites as sort of blocking what we see beyond the, the apparent heavens, or at least the immediate heavens. And yet, with particularly SpaceX's Starlink with 60 new satellites every few weeks. And as they add up, what this story is talking about is, look, we're going to have optical observations that are going to be impeded, particularly with the projected volume of satellites over the next two decades. I'll let the other presenters talk a bit about that. But I think that's a fundamental sort of social issue, which is the greater good. And there's a lot of good to be co to come out of having internet that's reasonably priced over current satellite internet and that is somewhat reliable and, and does not have the latency that's plagued some of the existing ones. So I think that's the, the, the counterbalance of this story from my point of view, Martin. Yeah, certainly, Frank. Martin, what's your thoughts on this one? So years ago, my dad took a photo of what he was convinced was a satellite. He was telling everybody about it, said he could see it with the naked eye. It was over his house for a whole day. Uh, even said you could see the dishes on it really, really clearly. I looked at it and I'm like, yeah, it's a helium balloon in the shape of a number two. And just happened to be the way that the sun was shining on it. I have to ask, I mean, what are all these satellites doing? Do we need them all? It's a lot of satellites that are potentially going to be launched. They say there are no rules currently dictating how bright they can be. What happens if laws later come in that do dictate how bright they can be? What can you do about that? retrospectively probably not i mean to me if i was the company that was putting these things up i'd probably make them as non-reflective as possible it's obviously a shame to pollute in, in particular the night sky i mean okay you look up in the air in, in here in london it's orange because of the sodium street lights but in the country it's amazing just what you can see into space let your eyes get accustomed to the dark and what you can see is absolutely incredible the other thing that i, I will mention um, I think they mentioned something like 42,000 satellites in the next 20 years they're looking to launch. Congestion, frequencies, how long before they look to snatch spectrum? Are they, you know, is, is, is this stuff coming down to earth on the equivalent of Wi-Fi frequencies? Are we going to find that our Wi-Fi is affected? Are we suddenly going to be losing microwave bands or you know other bands that we might be using for things whether that's amateur stuff or you know legitimate you know broadcasters or other they're going to find they're getting interfered i don't know there's going to have to be a hell of a lot of global coordination on this and i just hope that the people that are doing it at the risk of being cheeky and not offcom um are um of you know they know what they're doing yeah yeah well the other one why you were saying that suddenly came to my mind if you've got 42,000 satellites all beaming stuff down to Earth, I mean, we already had to do the EMs, uh, the radiation uh, data. That, that spreadsheet Ofcom sent out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, all right, it's all going to be low. It's all going to be fairly low radiation when it, it gets to the Earth. But if you've got 42,000 of them squirting that radiation mm -hmm. down, I'm not a tree hugger, I, but I'm just wondering. And it's microwave radiation, isn't it, of course? so Yeah, yeah. Leslie, what's your thoughts? To be honest, Martin, I don't know. I mean, I've been reading through this article. I'm not, I'm, well, I, I think it's called um, disruptive technology, and that's a whole wide field in itself. When, you, you know, you get a status quo and then something comes in and it just knocks everything we know sideways. So that's what I think is occurring. I agree with the comments about going into the city and then into the countryside. I've experienced that when, I, when I've gone from London down to Cornwall. The, the difference in, in what you can see is absolutely amazing. But 42,000 is a huge number, really. Let's just see where it goes, you know. And, and as there's no, uh, what, was, what was that thing? It's about in, no international um, agreements on this. To be honest, I don't see... I don't see them agreeing on it, to be honest, because every, every country's got their own interests. So where it goes, who knows? Well, yeah. I mean, the other thing I was thinking of, and I did jokingly say this earlier on uh, in our pre-chat, is the microwave boys do uh, rain scatter 
Uh, is there an opportunity to do satellite scatter? Hi, hi. <laughs> and the satellite's going, no, we're, we're not carrying on. We're going back to Earth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, dear. Bill, what's your thoughts? I actually think satellite scatter will be possible off of this constellation. <laughs> they do it off of planes now. Just a little background here. We're talking about a soon to be out of beta test internet service provider using low earth orbit satellites. So SpaceX, Starlink, they're, they're between 340 kilometers to 1300 kilometers. They're using the KU band, the KA band and the V band. Uh, for folks aren't familiar with those, the KU band is 12 to 18 gigahertz. KA bands 26.5 to 40 gigahertz, and the V band is 40 to 75 gigahertz. So they're going to be using, so from the satellites down to people, it's going to be the 10 gigs and, and the 37 gigs. Satellites to the gateways are going to be on the 17 gigs, the 18 gigs, and the 38 gig band. Back from your terminal up to the satellite you're transmitting up in 14 gigs or 48 gigs or 50 gigs and um, from the gateways to the satellites going back up it's going to be uh, 20 I guess it's 28 gigs 29 gigs 48 gigs and 50 gigs there's a big huge slices in there I'm holding my hands out but no one can hear me hold my hands out but the, these bands are huge huge so they're going to have uh, bandwidth to use interestingly enough this is the first company of many um, there is at least two more that are planning to also launch their own constellation of satellites in this lower earth orbit band area so that they can provide low latency internet connectivity to pretty much everywhere in the world but getting back to the main article is the, the concern is, is that as people are doing not only amateur astronomy, but research optical astronomy, that these things will be in the way. <laughs> and, and, and that's a, a, a legitimate concern. I saw a story maybe yesterday, I think it was, that they're talking about not using certain amateur radio bands on the dark side of the moon so that we have radio telescopes that can also reuse those bands without interference for radio astronomy on the dark side of the moon. This is a lot closer. This is uh, more accessible. You know, Frank was talking about the dark sky area, areas that they're specifically protecting on Earth today from light pollution so that they can have good night observations. There's one about two hours away from here, one of the state parks has been designated as a, as a light pollution-free area so that you can get astronomy. So we're willing to designate areas for astronomy, but yet there might be you know stuff floating in, in the way that's man-made and was put there. So it's it's a really it's a really concerning issue. And I'm not exactly sure how it's going to end up in the long run. That has to be very expensive to, to launch all these satellites and maintain them. And I don't know what the service life is on these things. And I know they have plans on, on what to do with them when they're end of life so that they can, you know, not become space junk. But at the same time, it's, you know, their normal operating life may actually be optical junk for, for, for those that enjoy the astronomy hobby. So it's a very, very complex and concerning situation going on here so I, I really don't know where it's going to end yeah yeah i don't think there's any easy answer chris have we left you anything else to say on this one well, i was going to say bill stole the most of under there um i was going to mention about this other these other companies so there's a company called one web that are doing something very similar interesting they're a uk-based company and have some funding from various sources including richard branson interestingly um because of course, SpaceX is a is an Elon Musk company, and I think there's a lot of uh, rivalry, isn't there, between those individuals, which is quite interesting. Um, but I mean, it's interesting because, you know, technology-wise, you go back a few years, everything was geospatial. You know, all satellites were geostationary orbit for, for communications. The old Arthur C. Clarke 
you know, kind of, I think it was, I think it was his idea originally to, to put, um, to, to put, put satellites there because they're in a fixed point in the, in the sky. Problem is, geospatial orbit is a very, very, very long way away. And I think this, this new model seems to be, let's just get lots of small satellites and just get loads and loads of them. In this case, 42,000 sounds like a, a really big number. And you can actually see them. I've seen this, the uh, solid ones go over. They go over a little, like a little um, convoy of them almost going past. You can sort of see them if you know where, where to look and when to look. Um, so, yes, I can imagine that uh, satellite for um, astronomers looking, trying to perhaps take uh, long exposures with, uh, with, with you know, photo uh, photographs, that could, uh, that could ruin your shot. You know, seeing these white lines across the sky potentially. So uh, um, that's reason. But yeah, I think as 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 Bill was saying, that the benefit of this these low Earth orbit satellites, satellites is that they aren't as far away, and therefore you don't get the same latency you get because up to geostationary orbit, because it's a very long way away, you do get latency, and that's just that's just physics. So by having them much closer to to the um, Earth surface, but having more of them means that actually potentially you can actually actually have much lower latency, and therefore be much better for communications than having that kind of you know if you remember that traditional time lag when people were uh, talking over um satellite phones and that sort of things because the uh that latency between them and the satellite was was you know potentially uh, a second or two of for it to catch up so um i can see some benefits but um yeah i can see also having just that many up there at some point there was some regulation coming maybe too late the space action one's interesting me looking at uh, the internet they're about five hundred pounds each. These are not small. This is not like a little CubeSat. This is a significant piece of kit. You know, significant, significant uh, satellite, a fair bit of weight. So yeah, five hundred pounds or two hundred twenty-seven kilos. I think it says here, is that's not a small, a small box. That's not a small CubeSat. That's that's a pretty hefty. Uh, you know, if that, if you were to, I mean, I don't quite know how it works when you've got spacecraft taking off. If you know, they're going to hit one of these things. You know, I don't, I don't quite know how that how that how that gets worked out. Are they tracking to the nearest meter? You know, how, whereabouts all these are in the space, or is it random? I presume there's some sort of uh, coordination to make sure they're all in the appropriate bit over Earth. But if you've got that many of them traveling at a phenomenal speed, yeah, some clever technology there. So we'll see how it pans out, but I suspect there might be some regulation coming at some point to, uh, to make sure this stuff isn't going to cause, you know, too many issues. Yeah, certainly is, Chris. It'll be an interesting one. And uh, I would guess they, they launch into a band, but even so, it's a lot, lots, a lot of interest there. We'll obviously keep an eye on that one. Moving to our next news story, I kind of like this one, and I think most people have got, got a soft part in their heart for it, but a Californian club has assisted animal rescue group with communications. So, all right, this is not life-threatening to humans, but... We've re we as amateurs have been involved in rescuing an animals uh, in in the big fires. There, let's start with Bill. What's your thoughts on this one, Bill? Yeah, this is just another example of of amateurs being available for their local served agencies to to take on any communications role that's needed, and that's exactly what happened. Is these these animals got essentially trapped in a lot of locations with uh, due to the wildfires out in the west. And uh, they were able to help out providing communications to the teams that actually go in and, and rescue those those animals. So it's it's a real, it's actually a really, I'm assuming, busy and uh, challenging work to, to help these folks out. Because uh, A, there's been a lot of fires, and B, the areas where the fires are, I would assume there's a lot of small and large animals because that that'd be one of the main reasons to live in that area is to be able to have an, animals and that kind of stuff. Yeah, I was just say the animals uh, obviously sometimes can't work their way out of a danger area and we help them, which is good. Martin, I know you're an animal lover because uh, I can't be 100% sure, but I wouldn't mind betting one of your cats is sitting on your lap while you're recording this. Uh, not at the moment, they're not, no. They're, it's, uh, because the weather's nicer outside, they're outside, but come the winter when it's wet, at least one of them will be in here with me. My thoughts on this, well, I always think it's amazing how many groups need amateur radio assistance. I get it during hurricanes when local networks crash and things like that, and I'm all for people assisting, but I can't help but wonder, you've got a team prepared to go in to rescue these, these these animals, do these teams not have PMR? I mean, have I have I missed something? Either way, it's a lovely story, and when all else fails, as they say, amateur radio. Well, 
with the geography of where they're at, I don't think PMR would help them very much because it's it's a lot of mountainous area. Okay, so you reckon they're doing like HF and uh, Envis and stuff then? And repeaters. Okay, yeah, fair enough. In which case, I stand corrected. Yeah, I'm also guessing that, you know, if you're getting volunteers in, you haven't got the resources to give the volunteers radios and things like that, whereas a radio group would turn up and set their own comms up, like we did uh, a good few years ago when we were playing with a fox hunt in a park and the police oh, yeah, turned up that. yeah the police turned up needed our help well, we diverted from a fox hunt to a uh, missing person hunt very quickly so yeah we have the technology frank what's your thoughts well i agree with what's been said i would amplify you know bill's comment which i think helped understand this that particular area is sort of in the edge of a mountain range and as I like to tell the folks out on the West Coast whom I know do repeater work, I said, you know, you just, you have your towers built by nature, you know, because they all try to get on a mountain peak and they can cover 100 miles, you know. And this area is just east of the capital of um, of uh, California, Sacramento, near the uh, just, just to the east of the famous Folsom Prison, if you're a Johnny Cash fan. And it is mountainous. There's one main highway through that area, US 50. So I think Bill spot on that it would take amateur radio to have kind of a, any kind of reliable, you know, type of communication. So it, it's a good story and it sort of expands what emergency teams and, and folks do, you know, here, at least here in the States and around, and around the world. But since this is a US story, I, I think that's great that they're doing this. Yeah, I I would assume that, uh, you know, it's a U.S. story, but I would assume amateurs in any other part of the world help out, as we all do. We know we do. But uh, nice to hear that we're doing something uh, for animals that, unfortunately, can't ask for our advice, but we've taken that on board. Chris, what's your thoughts? Well, nothing much more to add, really. It's just a good story, isn't it? It's just a good example of where amateur radios helped out... uh, you know, it's something quite important. So, uh, yeah, you know, well, well done to the guys, but yeah, nothing really much more to add more to. Yeah. Now, Leslie, you've got the last words on this one. My last words are good show, chaps. Well done. Yeah. yeah. Amateur radio, some of the professional systems are, are fixed upon what they can do. Like PMR, you're talking, you know, you, you mentioned that earlier. Uh, the thing is with amateur radio, it's flexible. We've got a, a cookbook of systems, repeaters, HF, NVIS, VHF is needed, and it's using that cookbook of, of different facilities depending upon the situation. But that's by the by. I'll go back to what I've said earlier. Good show. Well done. That's a nice feel-good story. Well, we're going to finish um, our news stories tonight with uh, one from uh, the Irish Radio Transmitting Society, They've released uh, their results of uh, an amateur radio survey they took uh, not so long ago, and there are some different some different discussions amongst the guys here. <laughs> Let's put it politely. <laughs> Go on, you can throw your hand grenade in the room, Leslie. Go for it. Oh, do do I really? Um, right, okay. Basically, I think this is, this is all part of the uh, an ITU. Uh, sorry, an IARU initiative to look at a strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats. I believe I'm correct on that. So if I'm wrong, I'm sure people will let me know. And the IRTS uh, conducted a survey. There is um, a YouTube video in which the results of that survey, and if anybody wants to look at it and go through it, I, my own personal view is I understand why these things are carried out and we need factual data as to what's occurring as opposed to my own opinion. You know, we can do things intuitively, but it's better that we have... If you're going to make decisions on how organisations run, you need some facts to to, to base it up. So so I get that. Unfortunately, I, I went through it and I found it as inspiring as as two week old cold dishwater it didn't inspire me 
it didn't want me to get up out of bed and fight the universe. And I, I cringed at it. Sorry, guys. The statistics does not replace leadership. And, you know, that, how can I? <laughs> so that's where I am. Some of the things, it, it, it is important. But when it went on to other things like organizational values, I know where they're coming from. But if I went down to my local club and tried to implement it, um, they'd look at me and go, no, we're not doing that. So I, I really sort of think it comes down to if clubs are doing the right things, they're going to be successful. If they don't going to do, if they're doing the wrong things, they're going to close down. Now that's only my own view. I'm going to throw it open to everyone else to see what they think. Over to you, Martin. Yeah, yeah. Well, I knew you on this one. I'm going to pass it to Frank next because I think Frank. My point of view was the survey didn't give me any surprises, but then a survey is only as good as the questions you ask. So it's just reaffirmed what I already thought, I think. But what's your thoughts, Frank? Well, listeners who have been on the pod or listen to the podcast for a while know my background is professional survey research and statistics. And I want to be. Uh, gentle with the author Adrian E I nine H A B and and certainly don't want to offend him. Very often, people in a group, and for lack of a better way of putting it, people in a group that are say fluent in Excel or any other you know type of spreadsheet or tool that will do summaries, uh, get stuck with doing a survey. And there's no saying anybody can do a survey. Not everybody can do one well. And a, a survey is a method. A study uses a method to collect information and make conclusions about it. In effect, telling a story with data. And I think this is where this one f fails uh, in many ways. And I think that I think in spirit, that's where Leslie is is coming from. Uh, it was pretty much just a dump of results without much narrative that that had a theme, made a point, uh, led the reader, such as, say, Leslie, through a narrative that at the end of the day, you may still not want to jump up and fight the universe, but you, you would want to get up and think about it at least. And I, I will say that to begin with. The second thing is these are what I call cattle call surveys, where you put a notice out and say, y'all come, y'all come fill this out. And they had 160 people who, who did that and then got very, very formal about the confidence level is 95%, margin of error 7%. Yeah, it's only if it's random. Uh, and it may be random, but we don't know if it is because of the method. Now, I've done surveys like that for ARL. They're cheap. They don't make you pull your hair out. Doing good survey work to get a good representative sample from a defined population. Those are all trade terms can be a P-I-T-A, as I hear the young people say. Uh, but it's like anything else, hard work is involved in getting good results. Now, is this better than nothing? Yeah, it is. And SWOT analysis is a very common form of evaluation research, and it's one that the IARU is pushing. In the uh, rehearsal, I made, I made the joke that it looks like somebody learned Excel graphics and they used it. I think this may be Google graphics given the colors that they use because it's all the Google colors. And I, and I don't want to be too harsh, but I agree with Leslie and Spirit that, yeah, the data are there, but, but you've got, um, it's like eating a Cornish hen. It's a lot of work for a little bit of meat. And I'll pass that back to you, Mark. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're not knocking the guys. I am, to me, I looked at it and thought, well, I'll, I'll raise this with the group, but it, it didn't really tell me anything I didn't really expect. I think the two shockers were, in the survey, only 3% of respondents were under 25, and only 2% of the respondents were female. That, to me, is also, unless you can back that up, but, and I'm sure they can, 
But they, they were the two shockers. Everything else in the graphs of that, most of that was pretty straightforward, I thought, what, what, what I'd have expected. Chris, what's your thoughts? Well, like you just said, for me, there's really nothing here that's unexpected. You know, the, 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 well, apart from maybe it's more extreme than I originally thought. Like you say, 96% male um, and a, a few abstainers and 2% female. Interestingly, I had an email this week from a lady who was on our club, Martin. So uh, that was that was good, but uh, very much unusual. Um, but yeah, really, really going through these questions, there's not, really nothing here that's surprising. You know, how are you interested in a hobby? Uh, if you've been in the hobby less than 10 years, from a friend of, sorry, yeah, less than 10 years, you know, you've been a fair, mem- fair, fair family member was 54%. What category, well, it's obviously an Irish things it talks about, uh, what category of, um, of license do you hold? And it's, well, they've got an Irish amateur license, it's, you know, the majority. It, it, there's nothing really here that's, that's, that's really jumps out to me at all to be a surprise. Uh, how long have been in the hobby? More than 20 years, 68%. You know, what's your preferred mode of operation? The majority are on voice modes, single side by FM, etc. The small number look interested in Morse code. Um, and of course, it's the, again, it seems fairly obvious that the ones that have been licensed longer that are interested in Morse code more than the ones that have been licensed less time. So, yeah, I, I just thought you were saying, Martin, really, it is, it is, there's nothing particularly here that's, uh, that jumps out to me to be you know unusual, which you know maybe you shouldn't be surprised at that because maybe that's perhaps we haven't got a good idea about about uh, you know the, the views of on our hobby. Yeah, well, you mentioned the lady who's uh, requested to join our club. My feeling on that one is she's welcome to join as an amateur, not as a lady, as an amateur. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's not got a license yet, but she's she seems to be very keen though, so that's good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and that that's where we will go on that one in the nicest possible way. Mine, what's your thoughts? Well, in case Leslie's hand grenade doesn't destroy everything, I'd like to jump in with a little bit more and a spare. There are some interesting answers reading through this, but I would argue that they're not right. And I actually see this as a bit of a waste of time. Um, it sort of seems to have generated quite a lot of false information, and as it doesn't give a fair representation, mainly because there was no obligation for people to fill this in. It only shows the stats from those people that got the survey that could be bothered to fill it in. You can't scale it up across the entire hobby. It doesn't work like that. Yeah, it gives you some info, but unless everybody responds, the rest of your information is completely null and void. I'll be honest, most of this you could get with a Freedom of Information Act from the reg- from the regulator. Sorry, guys, lies, damn lies, statistics. You can make them look whatever way you want. Next. Yeah, yeah, I thought you'd be a bit harsh, but uh, yeah. yeah. That's the way it is. Bill, last words on this one? Anytime I see these surveys, I always scroll to the SWOT analysis part because I'm always curious how other parts of the world look as far as the people that do fill out these um, surveys. And it's, uh, it's interesting to me how these SWOT analysis kind of strengths opportunities weakness threats they almost match the ones we've seen before on both sides of the pond so i always find that interesting weaknesses i always always pick in the, pick at these a little bit no engagement with stem promotion bodies or initiatives lack of engagement renders amateur radio practically individual indivisible they have uh, STEM promotion bodies in 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 uh, Ireland. That that's neat. <laughs> Limited influence with leg- legislators and regulators. Um, not sure how it works in Ireland. In the United States, you you basically buy legislators, so <laughs> that's not a surprise for a surprise weakness in my mind. Threats, lack of adherence to best practices in relations to child protection and by bullying legislation. This one I actually can can talk to as a threat. We have uh, protection for minors for all volunteer organizations that deal with minors, and it's it requires a uh, training and a background check, and it's not too terribly hard to. Uh, at least in Pennsylvania, get that spooled up for your club. So look at it and see if you can get that done. <laughs> see if they have a similar kinds of thing in, in uh, Ireland and, and get on board. The training's good. And, you know, I've been, I've been background checked uh, 
was six or seven times now for different organizations. It's fine. <laughs> it's just same three three clearances you have to go through. Not a problem. This is one. This is one that I thought was interesting. This is the one threat that they had. That's that's a little nuance different than one I've seen in other ones. The loss of uniqueness due to technological change they listed as a threat, and that is interesting. I, I really didn't ponder that very much, but with the with the you know clubs that are built around uh, microcontrollers now and the clubs that are built around the Raspberry Pi and and that kind of stuff that we're starting to see pop up in various locations. Yeah, it, I could I could see where you would see it's that you're not unique except we're still the only game show in town for worldwide for radio based hobbies so i find that interesting but other than that everyone i think everyone else uh, summarized the whole whole thing very well yeah you got some some numbers from the people who, who went out of their way to fill it out but it's not the same as as doing a blind survey of a large pool but you know i'm not going to knock the guy for doing it in fact all the guys for doing it because uh, you know there are a lot of people that don't do do surveys i mean we put a survey out at the beginning of the year for something and uh, very few of our listeners came back now that doesn't uh, mean uh we, we we took those answers and uh, in fairness we we analysed it and realised that surveys are not the right way to do what we wanted there. But, hey, that's the way it is. Martin, let me just add that with this kind of analysis, the old saying that when all said and done, there will be a hell of a lot more said than done, it's what's leadership <laughs> going to do with it. Yes. <laughs> no, thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. So, all in all, a reasonable, interesting news story. And uh, as I say, let's uh, let's not be down on the guy too much. I'm sure we said we weren't, but uh, I don't know that we got enough out of it. Us, the four, five of us over here, got enough out of it. Right. Let's um, let's find out what uh, you guys have been up to since the last time uh, we recorded a podcast. Now, Mr. Chris Howard, what have you been up to? So last time I've recorded a podcast, well, a little bit of HF, a little bit of hanging around the talk group, but not a huge amount, so not a lot of time. And um, I think you mentioned it on the last podcast, we had SSB Field Day. So I, my job is to, as the club secretary, is to do an awful lot of arranging, getting tents and radios and generators and always sort of everyone, everyone together and trying to run the whole thing, which is generally a pretty a pretty busy thing. So uh, we didn't have that many volunteers, you remember, Mark. I think we had about nine people in the end that actually turned up, which is not that many over a 24-hour period to uh, to operate. So um, I think I got the midnight to 4 a.m. shift to operate the radio with with, with uh, Steve and little member. But it's fun. Unfortunately, Frank didn't get a chance, I'm afraid, to operate in the Portal Operations Challenge. It was on the same weekend, unfortunately. It was just... Just too much on, I'm afraid, so I uh, didn't get to do that. But uh, that was uh, an interesting uh, in- interesting weekend. No doubt we didn't win because there weren't enough of us operating and we never really, you know, go out to win anyway. But uh, it was uh, it was fun all the less. So uh, back to you, Martin. Chris, you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. Your pay is going to be ducked. <laughs> yeah, and we, used a, and we used a different call sign. Um, Sutton and Jim used... Uh, a call sign that was assigned to the club 50, 60 years ago. And it only last time it was used was in a contest. Then we lost it through uh, not renewing it. And uh, a member, uh, our, our club uh, treasurer, renewed it. And we got it back. I got it here. It's G3, GFA, Golf 3, Golf Fox, or Alpha, which when I Googled it, it came up with some, it was a really old article from some, magazine from many many years ago and it was sudden shame so it was last used as martin was saying by by our club uh, many years ago and uh, so we, we reactivated it and we put it on the air yeah so if anybody did work g3 gfa then uh, you got uh, a new call sign in your log which uh, 
we may or may not use again. We don't you know. It's one of the club call signs. Right, mine. What have you been up to? Not very much, actually. Been on the DMR talk group a little bit, playing with four meters, um, but I'm getting interference on pretty much every other channel now, which is a bit disappointing. Other than that, um, I was configuring a new wireless access point to fill a null that I found on our uh, in our house. Same model, uh, different firmware. Needless to say, not compatible with my controller, so I had to upgrade the controller. But then, of course, the existing AP is not compatible with the new f- the software, so I had to force the firmware on those. Learning how to do that, winding the power down so the two APs don't interfere. Other than that, that's pretty much it. Yeah, well, I've worked you a few times on the radio, so uh, both on the talk group and GB3XP. So, uh, yeah, it's been good. It's been good. Right, I'm going to shoot across the other side of the pond to Bill, uh, because you're on a hard stop. So just in case we go long, what have you been up to, Bill? Yes, thank you. <laughs> just to pick on Chris there. Um... I did find that November 1950 shortwave magazine. So that was the one, and no doubt that's the last time it was used, I'd imagine, but uh, <laughs> maybe, but we'll see. Yes, interesting. <laughs> yeah, that would, that's really neat. I'll have to take a look at that. Now that the portable operations challenge is um, out of the, you know, done, I can let my, you know, my secret to my success, <laughs> which I think Frank's club fi- figured out too. I decided for the portable operations challenge to do a home reduced power effort with my home antennas and do nothing but FT8 and FT4. Unfortunately, due to that weekend, I was only able to get into the last um, time slot, but I got eh, about 23 contacts in about an hour. Um, So I think overall that, that was a pretty good effort. And then uh, the next day, just as a random aside, I got to uh, uh, work a soda station, CW only, from the picnic bench at my in-law's house in Bradford County. I forgot my uh, Morris key. (laughs) It's in the bag now. It was on the desk when I was moving stuff around. I didn't follow my own rule with the checklist, but I I figured out beforehand while i was sitting at the bench that uh, i still had macros in my uh kx3 and so i worked a station macro only <laughs> and uh i always want to give the reminder out because it tis the season the 65th annual pennsylvania cuso party will be october 9th and 10th 2021 more information at paqso.org and I will be working either Montour County or Bradford County. I'm not sure yet. I haven't actually finalized my plans yet because the my nephew's getting married on the, the 9th. So finally, uh, one, one of the nieces and nephews are uh, getting married. So I'll be in Bradford County on the 9th for sure. So that's why I'm thinking I may actually go up to the picnic table and, and work from there. But that's always my favorite uh, contest of the year. It's always the second full weekend on October. And we always have at least one DX station trying to work Pennsylvania County. So you too can join in from the folks on the other side of the pond. It's a fun contest. Certainly sounds it, Bill. Certainly sounds it. Okay. I've kept him under control this long. Go on, Leslie. What have you been up to? Me, Marty? What? (laughs) I'm always under control. Right, a couple of things. Um, first of all, we did a radio, Silverthorne Radio Club uh, camp at the annual camp, Golf X-Ray 2 Hotel Romeo. Bearing in mind, it's uh, it's been two years because of COVID and everything else that we've, we've not done this, and we finally got the opportunity to, to do it. So we had a fantastic weekend, sorting out gables, and I um, managed to play with the... Uh, AA35 antenna analyzer that's been sticking in the, in the cupboard and I'm glad it, I brought it with me because without it I would have been uh, uh, it would have been a very difficult figuring out what's wrong with these antennas uh, with just a multimeter so I'm, I'm very glad we did that and it was a very successful weekend the other one was uh, the Bluebell Radio um, sorry the Bluebell Railway I'll get that correct and I helped out them uh, get all the radios together and sort out the electrics for them. So I've done that. 
And then unfortunately, unfortunately, I had a bit of an accident, uh, a prang, and I broke my, my elbow. Now, I did discuss it, just discuss trying to fix it with super glue, but they wouldn't let me do that. Um, so I've, uh, I've been on a forced uh, leave from work, and I've just been pottering about, you know, doing all those little jobs. Oh, I've got to fix that, and I've got to repair that. So that's what I've been doing. But it's a, it's a bit of forced uh, rest for me martin i don't like doing this but um well i'm now finally getting around to those projects that i i put to one side hi hey, over to you yeah i know what you mean now uh, those elusive projects that we all got in our toolbox or junk room that we need to finish i've got a few of those as well leslie frank what have you been up to what other guys have said um the portable ops challenge was a focus a bit, and, and we missed one of my team members, Thomas N5WDG. He's an AT&T network manager for several states, and he was very busy uh, trying to get cellular service repaired down in Louisiana particularly, but he from Hurricane Ida. So amazing technology what they, they have. So we did a fixed station at Mike N5DU Shack, had a good outing. Did low power like Bill, and we focused on CW and FT8 exclusively, and we tried to go for distance. Had about 39 contacts, worked, uh, gosh, I don't know if it was Fiji or, or somewhere had one real, real big one. Just because I'm in the process of working with Ed, uh, DD5LP, who's on now on the other team, and Mike, VK3, Alpha, Victor, Victor, in processing the logs, gosh darn it, we didn't win the distance championship. We thought we had that in the back. But those results will be posted here in ju just a few weeks as soon as we vet those. So we had a great time. Uh, Mike's XYL is a chef class uh, person who always feeds us well when we meet there. So we had a good time there. I gave another talk uh, this past week, to this time to the Minneapolis St. Paul Twin Cities DX Association on Monday of this week. It was on price, performance, and satisfaction in HF rigs. Great, great group of hams. Very welcoming. Had good follow up, about 30 or so on the Zoom call. So I want to give a shout out and thanks to Pat Burton and Scott for inviting me to do that. It's about the eighth uh, talk on that topic. Uh, so I've been very flattered. I uh, completed another article that will be published in next month, October, issue of the Spectrum Monitor. I've mentioned it before on the podcast in preparation. It's called The Lost Tribe of Amateur Radio Operators, Blue Collar Scholars Who Started It All. And I've studied the early wireless magazines, newspapers, and books from circa 1900 forward, as well as the ARL's three official histories, of amateur radio. I spent about six months on this. That includes the famous 200 meters and down book written by Sutton, the 50th anniversary paper by Huntoon, and the centennial paper in QST by Maxwell. And in this paper that'll be out in a few weeks, you'll find that indeed there was an actual tribe of an amateurs who were organized. They were listed in a national publication with their names and given call signs, very much like popular electronics used to do with the WPE monitoring call signs. I proudly had one not being a licensed amateur. Wish I could find the paper. And so they were given call signs. And that was at least six years before Hiram Percy Maxim actually learned what wireless radio was from Clarence Tuska, a friend of his son's. And as we all know, Maxim and Tuska co-founded ARL in 1916. So I, I kind of document how the Maxim mythology was created by the public relations arm up at the ARL. Not unusual. And gents, I hope it'll be a lively read for you. It's um, in the October issue of Spectrum Monitor. Finally, I built four in-fed half-wave antennas, two for me. Uh, two for N5 Delta Uniform, my good friend here. Uh, one, a 1 to 9, and the other, a 1 to 49 base toroid. And as I looked around for parts, 
uh, I found a, a ham, uh, John Stum, K Kilo Golf 6 Z Bravo November, is selling uh, those for 10 or $12, depending on whether it's one to nine or one to 49 on eBay for $5 shipped with a hundred watt capacity. I couldn't source those parts and wind them myself for that. Built them in little small PVC tubes and was amazed at how well they tuned up for 80, 40, 20, 15, and 10. So uh, if you're interested, get them while you can. He'll probably raise his prices at some point, but uh, he says he's selling those to earn some money for one of the 599 Discovery QRP rigs. So I gave him my business. I may, I may buy some more. So that's always a great thing for Ham to try to make a dollar or two on the side to help them out in their own hobby. So, And the last I checked, I stayed out of trouble here at home. Martin, can you say the same? Almost definitely not, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, what, the, what the guys don't hear is, um, and I'm going to let a little secret out now for you long-term listeners. No! Oh, yeah, I'm going to oh, have to. Oh, here we go. Up. Yeah, yeah. I can feel Visit. Colin texting me already. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. It's nothing to do with Colin. We record this on a Wednesday night uh, when I'm on uh, early shifts. So I'm up at 4 o'clock in the morning to go to work. Mrs. B will come down, and if we haven't been finished by 10 o'clock at night, which only gives me, what, six hours in bed, if, if, if I ain't finished by 10, she comes down, rattles the door, and scowls at me. Now, I give her good credit for that because she is looking after me. So, yeah, that's another secret you guys uh, will know. She does get very protective over me, which is nice. Martin, it's called beauty sleep. Yeah, but I've lost that, Leslie. I, <laughs> I, I was well past that. <laughs> oh, dear. Right, what have I been up to? Well... I after the last podcast, after we recorded, oh, it was a nightmare. Finished recording, went to bed. Up at two the following morning. Uh, I'll, I'll give you local times. But up at two in the morning, on the road at three, four and a half hour drive to a ferry port. When we got there well early, which was made a lot of sense because I saw the traffic on the way back and it was unbelievable. A nine-hour ferry crossing out to Ireland where my PC crashed twice, losing all of the audio I'd edited. So I uh, arrived in Northern Ireland uh, where young Colin had booked us into an Airbnb. And I spent uh, the weekend with Colin, Mrs. B, Colin's wife, and my granddaughter, Holly, and uh, had a really good time. Uh, yeah, we did a little bit of radio. We were, I, I only took handy talkies with me. Uh, yes, I, I was on the talk group for a little while. Colin also had a, uh, at least one contact through the talk group using my DMR radio. And he, uh, we also were on uh, GB3NI Northern Ireland, which was uh, worked quite well. Came back with a load of uh, bits and pieces um, from which Colin can't store anymore at his house because he moved. So I brought back a number of radios, which, which is, is great news that I'm going to use. My uh, FT450D that I'm now thinking must be at least three years old, and if it's got 10 hours on the clock, it's, uh, it's doing well. So that's back in the UK to start working. Yeah, the talk group's uh, ticking along nicely as the figures on the, on the uh, internet show. Last Saturday, I did decide to try and do a bit of HF and reacquaint myself with a 450D. Unfortunately, HF was non-existent uh, due to an ejection from the sun, so uh, that killed it totally. However, I was playing with a, an antenna I took out to Ireland and thought, oh, that'll be all right. The auto tuner will pull that in. And it was a shortened G5RV. Uh, a G5 RV clone made for 20 metres and above. I think a bit of wet string would have loaded up better, quite honestly. We've had this we've had this discussion before with uh, short and G5 RVs, haven't we, Martin? Yeah, yeah, we did. We had this earlier this week. <laughs> I, a bit of wet string would have worked better. Yeah. It was horrible. 
uh, well, when he looked at it on the analyzer, yeah, yeah, I could pull it into one, the one with a with a manual tuner. But uh, for any of you newbies out there, I would suggest uh, don't even look at a G5 RV. It was very great for uh, Louis Vardry uh, for his when he probably did it on eighty meters in his garden with a valve transmitter. Uh, modern days, they don't load up very well, or or they're so inefficient they're not worth using. Okay, yeah, I'm now, uh, and I mentioned this last time, operating um, uh, in the, on the talk group mobile. Uh, at the moment, local time, when I'm on earliest, which is this week, which is always a record week, the week before we release, um, I'm on earliest, and I'm usually on at uh, 5 in the morning UK time, between 5 and 6, well, 4 and 5 UTC at the moment. And occasionally I get people on, and then often on round about lunchtime. The was one piece of information I'll give you: the ICQ uh, bridge was playing up a little bit uh, yesterday. We'll own up about it because we have no secrets from you guys. The fusion wasn't uh, connecting across into the bridge, so anybody who's on fusion could talk to fusion users, but they couldn't talk to uh, DMR or DSTAR users. Well, that we got fixed pretty quickly once I spotted it was a problem. The last thing I'm going to say, which is uh, you guys with me tonight wouldn't have heard, but on the podcast, start the podcast, there's a big promotion we're putting together on ICQ Podcast called the ICQ Podcast Hub. And what I'm proposing to do is on the 16th of October, Saturday the 16th of October at... Uh, 1900 UTC, uh, we're pr- proposing to have a get-together on the digital talk group. Now, for those of you who haven't got digital radios, obviously you can listen in with uh, the hose line or you can take part with Droidstar, which is a Android uh, application that will get you in. So... More in the next uh, podcast, the final up, but the pre-note is or we plan to do four, uh, start off by doing four of these a year, which is just a get-together um, and, and a chat answering questions or what we're really hoping is you come and tell us what you've been up to. And I am planning to move the time zones around a bit to assist people in other parts of the world as the uh, as the meetings happen so guys you wouldn't have known about that sorry it was just something that has been kicking around for a while and i just need to get it happening so um there you go frank over to you i know you wanted to mention uh, about what you'd done on we commented on the last podcast so you've got a couple of things you want to mention martin listen i want to want to thank everybody uh, for the uh, podcast team last time, and I believe Leslie was actually on that as well in discussing the generational changes study that that I wrote in collaboration with Scott Wright, K0MD. And I, I think the team had very, very fair comments. I want to emphasize two things about it. One is that one has the impression that as the age of the contesters in the ARRL sweeps take over the last two decades, measured each uh, every five years as it kind of marches forward getting older and older one would intuitively get the impression it's the same hams it's not no more than 50 percent of the same call signs were in any contest in one year and then five years later at maximum half or continuing in the next time window but they are from the same age group, the baby boomers, and we're getting almost no Gen Xers and millennials, a few Gen Xers, almost no millennials or post-millennials. So it's important to realize it's not just the same ham. It's from the same age group, which makes it a culturally rooted phenomenon. So I want to make sure that that nuance, you know, is, is the case. And the second thing I wanted to point out, we don't know how well the sweepstakes participants also participate in, say, the CQ worldwide stuff. So we don't know how much that generalizes. I do know that some do. 
I may take the time at some point to match the call signs from the ARRL group over with the publicly available CQ. And that percentage will tell us to some extent how much that is, is aging as well. And the kind of the come up and so of the study is like we said with regard to the uh, study in Ireland. Will those in charge who are of the same birth cohort care enough to make policy changes to attract younger hams into contesting? Now, whether you like contesting or not, it is an a- activity of, of amateur radio. So, you know, it is important. What's well, important to you or not is up to you, but it is an important one to the collectivity of amateur radio. So, if studies are done that are of good quality, and I believe, you know, this one is given the data, uh, whether or not leadership will make a change because it's against their vested interest, after all, they're not going to be around. Uh, That's really up to leadership. So I just wanted to amplify that and thank uh, the team from last time for the comments that they made. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for clarifying that one, Frank. That's a good one. Right, well, all that's left for me to do now is uh, wish you all 73s, and uh, then we'll move on to the next part of the podcast. So I'd like to thank Mr. Chris Harrod, M0TCH. Yes, thanks, Martin. Thanks, guys. Another uh, good episode. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for coming. I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Martin Rothwell, M0SGL. It's been a good evening. <laughs> he certainly has. Mr. Frank Hell, K4FMH. And I would say good evening as well, and welcome, 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 Leslie. It's a delight. I know we, you and I together will make the rehearsals significantly longer in the future. <laughs> we don't rehearse. We just have a quick discussion, but yeah. Uh, go on, Leslie. No, thank, thank you for inviting me, Martin. It's been an interesting discussion tonight. I was, I've enjoyed it. Yeah, <laughs> thank I you. Thought, I thought you would. And, uh, yeah, we'll say it's good. And last but not least, and hopefully we've still got you, Bill, and you haven't had to go off to your meeting, Mr. Bill Barnes, WC3B. Nope, I just got a cancellation text 11 minutes ago, so we're all good. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Martin and everybody, and... Uh, I ran out of coffee an hour ago. Yeah, about an hour ago now, uh, Leslie. So I don't, I don't have anything to dunk my uh, cookie into. <laughs> oh dear, no oh dear! Don't, don't, don't get him started, Bill. Please. He's, ta- he's taking on my bad habits. <laughs> yeah, we've all you are a negative bad. influence on my life. <laughs> Oh dear. What did I say to somebody the other day? Uh, they looked at me and they asked me a question and I said, Don't answer don't ask me questions I don't want to answer. <laughs> and they walked away and I thought, I got away with that one then. <laughs> oh dear. Okay guys, seventy threes, look after yourselves and we'll catch you soon. Jerry seventy three. Seven three. Keep your amateur ham radio podcast advert free by donating less than a length of coax. Visit www.icqpodcast.com forward slash donate now. For all the news, links and information, visit www.icqpodcast.com. And now it's time to have a look at the news in brief with me, Colin M6BOY. We start with news here that the RSGB have released membership uh, numbers uh, covering the last few years and uh, most importantly is uh, an obvious upturn in membership the RSGB particularly during the uh, pandemic times and now they've got a total number of membership of 22 just over 22,000 of which uh, just over 2,000 of those are overseas so there's 20,000 active rsgb members there in the uh, uk uh, from there so that's uh, steadily climbing over the last couple of years and there's obviously a, a great positive sign to say that uh, the hobby's picked up some health uh, during the pandemic times uh, so we'll pop the numbers on the icq podcast webpage and check those out let's say for more information 
Ofcom has released uh, some information in relation to the upcoming uh, Commonwealth Games in Birmingham, which are taking place in the summer of 2022. Uh, now, basically, there's going to be obviously tons of uh, wireless devices from walkie-talkies to the organizers' TV uh, broadcasting uh, uh, equipment going out to the global audience. And because of that, as I say, they're going to be working hard to protect and maintaining the airwaves for the all wireless communications. So as always, there's a, a document being released, uh, and as I say it uh, will show, as I say, say, the high demand in the spectrum and the limited availability for radio resources in their locations, and they're encouraging early application for licenses. So again, there's a document that are being released to check out. Let's say if you're in that Birmingham area, uh, say you might want to check see what might be available uh, in the summer of 2022. Now, there's a proposed ban for all radio transmissions between 300 megahertz and 200 megahertz in the area designated uh, f in the shielded zone of the moon, uh, which would be applicable uh, to the Mars area. Uh, now, the spectrum uh, would instead be used for radio astronomy operations. I mean, amateur radio satellite services that are currently on 435 MHz and 1260 megahertz will no longer be available to spacecraft in the lunar orbit, such as Lunar Oscar 93 and Lunar Oscar 94. Uh, so, say so there's lots of interest here uh, that's going to hit on this proposal. Uh, AMSA are sort of leading the way in uh, this discussion area here, but certainly it's something to keep an eye on, say, if you're a guy that likes operating uh, satellites, as I say, that that could obviously affect operations going forward. So, again, we we'll put the information on icqpodcast.com, check that out and see if that's of, of interest to yourself. Right, now we're going to head over to our features episode, and uh, Ed Durant, DD5, Lima Papa, is discussing the new Open GD77 firmware. As always, hope you enjoy. And now, what you've all been waiting for, this episode's feature from the ICQ podcast. Most listeners will know that the ICQ podcast team have talked about getting into operating through satellites for several years. Planned dates have come and gone. Those of you who aren't already using amateur satellites will probably have the same experience as the non-satellite experienced ICQ team members. It's so complex. We don't want to invest oodles of money in computer control, pan and tilt antenna systems, so let's presume we're going to go out away from the house, portable with simple equipment. If we stay with the simpler FM satellites, the equipment isn't too bad. One or two HTs to give you FM receive and transmit. An antenna, yes, across Yagi is nice, but to keep it really simple, let's just pick a pass where it's close enough to be able to access satellite or at least hear it with a whip antenna on the HT. Note, I'm not talking about the rubber ducky antenna that comes with the radio, although some people have managed it with that as a newcomer Trying to just use the rubber ducky antenna is going to put you off. And when you can't hear anything, let alone put a signal into these flying repeaters. Okay, so if we have two HTs, one for transmit, one for receive, so that you can make sure when you call someone that you are calling on the right frequency. There's this nasty effect called Doppler shift, which means you need to change your transmit frequency as the satellite approaches and leaves your location. If you don't tune your radio, you won't hear the satellite. Also, to get the best signal into the bird, you also need to tune the transmit frequency as well as receive. Hang on though, our HTs don't have a tuning knob, they are channelized. So you need to program in several channels across the frequency range that the Doppler effect will use, and you will need to switch from one channel to the other as the satellite passes over. If you're using two HTs, that means switch the channels at the right time together as well as making sure the whip is pointing in the best direction and you could also need to talk and listen. By the way, did I mention that different satellites use different frequencies? So you need to have groups of channels per satellite. Are we having fun yet? Just a minute. We also need to know when the satellite is coming over, from which direction and where it will track and what frequencies and possibly CTCSS tones it will use. OK, we can find that out on the computer beforehand and print it out. Something to hold in that third hand that you have now realised that you need? In this day and age, you would think there must be an easier way, and not one where you have to sell your house to buy it. 
Well, I'm happy to tell you that although the big-name ham radio manufacturers have not come up with a suitable complete solution, a group of open-source programming amateurs have. And the platform they chose to work on are the cheaper HTs from China, the DMR ones that cost between $75 and $100, pounds, euros. These are not the newest radios either, as this development has been running for a while. But several of the supported radios are still current models. If you already have one, you're laughing, as the cost of this software is nothing. As I said, this is open source software. The main aim of this software is to make these industrial-like handy talkies into amateur-friendly radios for analog and DMR FM usage. The satellite code inside the radio is a recent addition. The package consists of new firmware for the HT and a new control and programming software for your Windows PC. The package is called OpenGD77 and it was originally written for the Radiodity GD77 radio but was then extended to cover radios that run with similar hardware. So there are now five different HTs supported. The Radiodity GD77, also known as the TYT MD760, Radiodity GD77S, the Baofang DM1801, also known as Baofang DM860, the Baofang DM1801A, the Baofang RD5R, also known as the Baofang DM5R Tier 2. So, what does OpenGD77 do? Well, I won't cover all the great things it does to make using a HT with DMR great. My highlights in this part of the software is that it allows you to type in the talk group number if you want to directly on the keyboard and then select to have a private, direct call or a group one. The code plug, what DMR radios call their configuration file, becomes a lot smaller and simpler, more akin to an analog FM handheld. OK, now let's get to the really nice additions in the firmware that makes these already good analog and digital HTs into great devices to do satellite contacts with. What were those needed actions we listed before? OK, all of those radios do 2 metres and 70 sems of course. But you don't have to have a second radio to check you are transmitting on frequency as the software takes care of both the transmit and receive frequency setting for whichever satellite you choose from their list. It also adjusts the transmit and receive frequencies to allow for Doppler shift. No more multiple channel shifts. How about this? That list gives you the satellites that will be in range of your exact location. The radio also indicates when you should start hearing it and when it has gone over the other horizon. It gives you a polar diagram to show from which direction it will come and go, as well as telling you the compass degrees and angle in the sky of the bird. Oh, and that diagram on the HT screen, it also shows you where on the curve of the pass it currently is. So, the radio tells you everything you need to know to track the satellite correctly. All you need to do is push the PTT and talk. There is little preparation before you can use the satellite functions. You have to enter your location in Latin long, the date and exact time, as well as your time zone. And before you start looking for the satellites, you need to load the KEPS data. This is regularly updated data that defines the exact orbits of the different satellites. This is done on your PC through the programming or CPS software and it's very straightforward, certainly a lot more straightforward than it would have been up to now. OK, here's a test I did, just to prove that the scheduled pass actually took place of SO50. Signals are not that strong, because I'm only using a whip in the top of the HT, so obviously a, a better antenna will make a lot of difference. At least the point is proven that the radio has told me when the satellite's coming over, it set the frequencies correctly, and it's even showing me on its screen where the satellite is. Here we go with a short audio clip. OK, 
I, I know you'll say it was very difficult to hear anything in the noise, but uh, that's the way it was. Better antenna always helps. OK, where do you go to get full information about this software? Well, if you have one of the supported HTs, you only need the software. If you want to buy a HT to use the software, then also the information is in the link that is on the ICQ Podcast website at icqpodcast.com. Thanks everyone, and uh, catch you later. This is Ed, DD5LP. The ICQ Podcast. Getting it said for amateur radio. Well, many thanks there to our friend and colleague Ed Durant, DD5 Lima Papa, for his uh, review on the GD77 um, firmware, open source uh, firmware review. So many thanks for that, Ed, for us. And as I say, uh, great to have uh, as a, uh, a voice there, uh, a different voice doing the feature. So we always appreciate when Ed uh, say, uh, does that for us. Right, well, uh, we're going to move uh, as we wrap up the show and uh, just get you to talk a bit more about uh, say your idea and hopes for the ICQ hub um, chat that you're you're lining up uh, for a few weeks time and uh, just to give people a flavor of exactly uh, you know what they uh, may expect or what we're trying to get out of this and uh, see if we can uh, launch something new yeah we certainly are Colin and in fairness uh, you heard if you've listened all the way through you've heard this uh, talk about it in the promo at the beginning of the program i mentioned it to the uh, presenters that were on with me this week it's something that we've pulled through very quickly and i needed to announce it this episode so we've got one more uh, release before we go live with that but the idea is you know so many of you have said to us hey you guys have a lot of fun you seem to enjoy yourselves uh, you seem to be a radio club almost. Why can't I be part of it? So the idea is you can be. And, you know, we are happy to get as many people on to chat. The idea is to try and do it as a two-hour session. And as I've said, if you live in um, Australia, New Zealand, I know you're a million miles off the time uh, time that I'm choosing but I've already made the decision that I have to move the time slot so that there will be t different time slots. And we're intending to do this at least four times a year. So at least four times a year, get together. If you guys want it more than four times a year, and it turns out to be uh, successful enough, then there's a very good chance we'll do it more than four times a year. But the initial one is to get together, have a chat, uh, you tell us about what you're doing, because as I said in the promo, we're as equally interested in what you're doing as you are on what we're doing. You know, we're all amateurs together. And I did find that quite strange when I first started talking to people on the, the talk group and people say, yeah, it's you, Martin, isn't it? And I was, yeah, well, why wouldn't it be? I'm an amateur. I, you know, I do this sort of thing. I enjoy the hobby. So, uh, yeah, it's kind of... We're going to set up it as a hub, and even if you haven't got digital, you can join us. There's ways of doing it, Colin. Fantastic, guys. So we uh, we look forward to as many of you as possible. Uh, join us uh, as we do that there. And as I say, uh, that be uh, fingers crossed we'll be able to get this running. And as, I, as Dad mentioned, it's four times a year, so it'd be great uh, I say, to do it from there. Right, we need to uh, do our thank yous this episode. So uh, on the donor front, we'd like to thank uh, Douglas Rosser, VK2 Delta Charlie Romeo, for his uh, very kind donation to the show, and to Sandip uh, Nambia uh, for setting up a subscription donation. Many thanks for doing that for us. Uh, as I say, your, uh, your wonderful uh, contributions, your kind contributions, uh, help us, uh, as they keep us advert-free and paying our bills on the internet here. So uh, we're really gratefully appreciated for that. If you would like to uh, help us out and uh, show some of the value you've received from the show, all you need to do is go to www.icqpodcast.com forward slash donate. And the best uh, thing we suggest is uh, think of a, a number uh, for what you uh, got for the show, you know, maybe a, a, with the equivalent of a cup of coffee or, you know, a, a fine dinner out maybe or, a, I don't know, a trip to the, the cinema and uh, turn that into a financial amount. Click on one of the options there and uh, pop it our way and uh, say we'd really appreciate uh, say you guys helping us out and continue to keep the show funded in the very, very kind way you've been doing uh, for the last uh, 13 years. 
As always, we'd like to thank our colleagues who joined us on the News Roundtable. Uh, so we'd like to thank uh, Chris, Mike Zero, Tango Charlie Hotel, Martin, Mike Zero, Sierra Golf Lima, Leslie, Golf Zero, Charlie India Bravo, Frank, Kilo 4, Foxtrot, Mike Hotel, and Bill, Whiskey Charlie 3 Bravo, for taking part in the News Roundtable. So many thanks, guys, for taking uh, part there. Right then, well, I think that just about wraps up everything from our sightings for this uh, episode number 360. Uh, and, of course, the last thing for us to do as we, we finish off every episode, of course, is to do a very important job, uh, which is to uh, find uh, chocolate biscuits and make a cup of tea for Mrs. B. So uh, I hope you've uh, got something lined up. Yeah, certainly have, Colin. We're going to have a cup of tea together in a minute, and I'll find Mrs. B a chocolate biscuit. And, uh, yeah, things are good at the moment. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, no problems. Back to you. Wonderful. Well, look, what we'll do is we'll bid everyone 73s and we'll catch up with you all again in a fortnight's time. 73s all. Yeah, 73.